In this final session in our series, we're going to focus on the other great purpose for marriage and family, and that is the raising of godly, self-governing children. We've already looked at what the Bible has to say about marriage. We've looked at the topics of sexuality and procreation, and now we're going to turn our attention to uh, the raising of our children. God made us to rule over creation. We've talked about that many times, to exercise godly stewardship and dominion. But before people can govern externally, they first have to be trained to govern internally. So in other words, the most basic level of dominion is what the Bible calls self-control or self-government. And our healthy, the health and the flourishing of our nations requires self-governing citizens. God created the family, therefore, to really to be the center, the place where people are trained in self-government. To paraphrase the uh, famous Puritan pastor Hugo Grotius, he said this, he knows not how to rule a kingdom that cannot manage a province, nor can he rule a province that cannot manage a city, nor can he manage a city if he knows not how to guide his family, nor can he govern his family well if he knows not how to govern himself. The Bible stresses that the family is the primary training ground for mature, virtuous, godly character. In the words of Pastor Philip Lancaster, throughout the ages, the family has been the nursery of faith for each new generation, the primary place in which Christian discipleship has occurred. The future is shaped generation by generation in the home. A vision for the work that happens in our homes today has been almost entirely lost. Today, it's very typical for us to leave the education of our children to television, to video games, to state-run schools, to their peers. Is it any surprise that so many of them, when they go away to college, walk away from their faith? Today, we see work as something that largely happens outside the home. Children leave the home when they go to school. Parents, mothers and fathers each head to their own separate places of work. Even simple tasks that used to happen in the home, like preparing meals and eating together, are being lost. Today, largely, our houses sit empty, little more than just places to sleep for a few hours before we head back to work and to school. I think this is wrong, and I think as Christians, we have to recover the important work that God intended to happen in the home. We have to recover a vision for what it means to be parents, to be mothers and fathers. Again, today, fathers are largely seen as expendable. Mothers less so, but if they choose to stay at home and raise their children, they're kind of looked down upon as not really contributing anything of value to society. How different things look when we look to the scriptures. Here we find motherhood and fatherhood portrayed really as sacred tasks that are absolutely significant to the health and the well-being of children, but not only children, to the well-being of nations and the entire human race. In the Bible, mothers and fathers are literally commanded to train up their children to know and to obey and to delight in God's word. To mothers and fathers, God says this in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8, you shall teach my ways, my commandments, my precepts diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, in other words, all the time. The Bible teaches that parents bear the first and the most fundamental responsibility for educating their children. I remember as a young married man, I didn't quite get this. In fact, I was challenged on it by another one of my friends. And he was asking me about my thoughts on educating our kids who were just infants at that time. And I said, well, you know, when they get old enough, I'm sure they'll go to school. And he said something very simple, but it, it had a huge impact on my life. He said, Scott, did you realize that God actually gives you the primary responsibility for educating your kids? And I thought, yeah, I guess, I guess I knew that. <laughs> I don't think this means that we can't 
take advantage of schools, but it does mean that we have to take primary responsibility for what's going on there. We have to take responsibility for our children's education. We can't outsource that and expect somebody else to do that job. Both mothers and fathers share in this responsibility. Proverbs 6, 20 through 21 says, My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Certainly grandparents, certainly church leaders and schools and Sunday schools, they can all play important roles in this process. But it's the father and the mother that have the primary responsibility and the privilege of educating and discipling their children. It's critical that they have to be united in this endeavor. And yet I believe that the father has a special responsibility as the head of the house. Ephesians 6, 4 says, and you fathers bring up your children in the training and admonition of the Lord. So I think that fathers have a special responsibility to provide a kind of a vision for the education of their children in the home. And the Bible, of course, is to be the principal curriculum. It's content, it's doctrine, it's instruction. And that has to be more than head knowledge. It has to be applied in the family. One of the great things about families is this is a great place to actually put the Bible into practice with those that are closest to us. It has to be applied there and in the church and in the neighborhood and then ultimately in the wider community. Well, how do you do this? There's so many ways. We'll just touch on them. You know, Kim and I have done this, my wife, in a, in a, in a number of ways. For example, uh, we started at an early age doing Bible memory or scripture memory at mealtimes. And we'll all just kind of share together before meals uh, the scripture that we're memorizing. We've also made it a point to do family devotions on Sunday. And those have become very fun times. My kids are now teenagers and in college. But when they come back, they make a point of making sure that we're doing family devotions on Sunday. What do we do? It's very simple. I just get out the guitar. I'm a terrible guitar player and singer, but I'll play and we'll sing some songs. Uh, we'll pray, we'll discuss what the pastor talked about at church, how do we apply that in our lives, and then we'll even hold each other accountable for some application. Very simple. But I do think that fathers have to have kind of a vision for their role as pastors in the home, and that's one of the ways you can express that. I think really, very importantly right now, especially in the United States, we have to be really aware of what our children are picking up from the broader culture because uh, we live in the age of social media and smartphones and tablets. Everywhere our kids go, they've got this flood of information coming to them from the culture. So we can't be passive about that. We have to be proactive. We have to be aware of what they're seeing, what the messages are, what worldview is being taught them, either directly or indirectly. I really encourage you to think seriously about that. Don't just give your kids a tablet for them to play with. Discipline, of course, is also very important. Proverbs 13, 2 very famously says, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but whoever loves him is diligent to discipline him. Discipline is always done to correct, not to punish. It always has to be done in love. I recognize this is not easy. I struggle with this, but it's so important. Kim and I, in, in our situation, we found uh, a very helpful image in the raising of our kids to be the image of a funnel. And the narrow end of the funnel represent those early years of their lives where you need to give them a lot of hands-on direction, a lot of training, a lot of discipline, a lot of close supervision. So consequently, there's less freedom because they're simply not ready for it. But as they grow, that funnel begins to widen as they learn and begin to apply what they've learned and are able to correctly handle freedom, then the freedom goes, and ultimately, by the time they're adults, that's the top end of the funnel, they should be out there with complete freedom, able to govern themselves. That's the vision. So as parents, it should be the goal, uh, our goal, to have the hearts of our children, to win their hearts, and we win the hearts of our kids as we serve them sacrificially, with compassion, with tenderness, by washing their feet, by often setting aside our desires in order to do what's best for them. One of the most basic tasks of any mother and father, frankly, is to show God to their children. You see, children know their parents before they know God personally. 
as parents open their hearts, as they love and as they train their children, as they walk with God openly in their families, as they talk about God's active involvement in their lives and what God has been doing, the reality of God in their lives, as they urge their children to follow the Lord with them, then the children have an opportunity to experience God as a living reality in their own lives. Psalm 127, 3 through 5 says this. It says, sons are a heritage from the Lord. They're like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Why arrows? Have you ever thought about that? Why arrows? Well, here's a thought. You know, with the sword, a soldier can only strike or attack as far as he can reach. But with a properly made arrow, he can strike an enemy way beyond. So I think that like that, our children should far surpass us in their godly maturity and in their impact for God and his kingdom. Our children should advance the kingdom and their children and their children and their children. It's a ripple. So make it your goal to raise a quiver full of well-made arrows through whom God's kingdom can advance and bless your nation in every sphere of society.